Journey to Esquire Scholarship and Leadership Program virtual graduation presentations, April 25th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm very excited that we're still able to um, do this portion of the program. I'm also, frankly, very um, happy and I feel blessed that we were able to meet our financial <laughs> obligations to the students and get them all their scholarships. Because as you know, with everything going on, um, a lot of things just came to a complete stop. And so we we're able to raise enough money to get everyone their checks. And we got that out to them because especially now, um, having the um, financial means to meet your obligations is really important. But we know, you know, life is a little crazy right now. Everything is so different for us. This is something our generation has not experienced. Um, and so we're all trying to figure out what we're going to do next. Um, so we have to figure out how are we going to get jobs and how we're going to take the bar exam or prepare for it or when it's going to be. <laughs> so um, I figured this would be nice to still do so that at least we can celebrate and acknowledge all the great experiences we had thus far. Um, and it could be a bright spot in everything that's going on and it can help us stay motivated to keep going because life is going to keep going despite all of the um, chaos right now. And so here we are to celebrate all these wonderful people. Um, we're going to have opening remarks by Samaya, who is um, co-founder and she is the vice president. Um, and then I will finish off with a few words about our interns and then go into the student presentations. And that is the, this is the order we're going to do it in. It's going to be Anna, Adriana, Forrest, Kishni, Justin, and Marcia. And some of them have um, PowerPoint presentations and slides. Some are just going to speak from their heart, which I love. Um, and so students, you're just going to go one after the other. And we have a keynote address. So I'm so excited. Um, the introduction to the keynote speaker will be by Brielle F. Tucker, who is a, a pilot program alumna and now on the board as a board member. And then we have Demetra Simmons, I think Liggins is what I heard, is the new name. So congratulations, Demetra. And I will have some brief closing remarks. We also have um, a little video yearbook that um, Kishni put together for us. So hopefully we'll be able to see that and hear the music. And I'll be sharing all of this on our social media, of course, and YouTube and et cetera. So you can share it with your friends and family. So now I'm going to pass it to um, Samaya. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, like Jocelyn said, I'm Samaya. I'm co-founder and board member of the Journey to Esquire program. I'm so happy to be here with you all this morning. Um, like Jocelyn said, these are very strange and in some ways anxiety inducing times, but I think it's important for us to take to continue to take stock of the good things. So while the end of your law school journeys are probably not what you envisioned them to be and things change so quickly, so dramatically, um, this is still a really huge milestone in your lives, both the conclusion of your law school journeys, but also the fact that you got through this um, program and put in a lot of hard work over the course of the last year. It's kind of hard for me to believe that this is the end of the second year of this program. We started off in um, the 2018-2019 school year as the Diversity Access Pipeline Program where we had the pilot program, um, got things going for the first year and then regrouped last summer and rebranded as the Journey to Esquire Program. Um, we thought the name was more befitting and more, more clearly indicated that this was a law-based program as opposed to any some other sort of a pipeline program, but the core mission and the goals of the program have stayed the same to infuse the pipeline from law school into law practice with lawyers who are historically underrepresented in the practice of law. Um, and I'm really excited to see everybody's presentations today because I know I was blown away when we did the interview process last summer to see the 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 talents that y'all brought to the table and over the course of the last year going through the programming i think you have honed many of the important skills that you'll take with you into the legal profession the sorts of skills that aren't necessarily taught in law school but that are really critical to your success as a lawyer so that you really can be part of the steady stream of the pipeline 
um, into a successful practice of law. Um, the program consists of a couple of different aspects. There's the, the modules that you have participated in, focusing on things such as your own, your, your wellness as a lawyer, um, time management skills, what diversity in the legal profession looks like and how to break barriers that are put up um, in a profession that perhaps is not designed to advance the interests of the non-dominant groups. Um, but then also like the practical things, how are you gonna get through the bar exam? <laughs> how do you strengthen your writing? And um, you all have shown an immense amount of commitment um, to yourselves and to this profession um, through your participation in this program. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to celebrate the end of this journey with you guys. Um, and the journey to Esquire, the group, the, the board that uh, led by Jocelyn, shepherded by Jocelyn and all of her brilliance and her vision um, is also made up of a group of people who have stories similar to yours. We're a group of board members. We have Machina and Jamila and Brielle and Suzanne and myself and Jocelyn who all had different upbringings and different journeys to the law and then since we entered the practice of law different career paths um, but have each individually um, found the ways to figure out how to navigate the profession as diverse or minority lawyers and through this program we hope that we've imparted on you some of the skills we've had to figure out for ourselves um, to get to where we're at in our careers. So um, much gratitude and much appreciation for the students. I'm excited to watch the presentations and I'm gonna turn it over to Jocelyn now. All right, thank you. I heard we're having some technical difficulties with the live streaming. I'm not sure why that is. It might not be allowing me to record and do the live streaming. So please apologize to anybody who's reaching out to you and let them know we will send out the recording ASAP. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our wonderful interns. Um, one of them is on the um, video conference with us, Horace. He's not represented here on the um, in the picture. He wasn't able to make the photo shoot, but he was instrumental in helping me organize all the modules. And he and I and Damien Rape, who's um, on the left, would show up to the module, set up, make sure everything was ready, and then help pack up my car, which was a huge, huge help. Um, and then we had the wonderful Shannon Walker, and she was um, our social media guru. And she um, had big shoes to fill because Kishni used to be our social media um, intern and did an awesome job. And so Shannon did a great job as well. She had the additional um, duty of also posting all of our podcasts to all of our social media platforms and did an excellent job and really shared a lot of our things on her personal page, as well as some of the other interns. And we have Abigail, who's also with us on a video call. Abigail Dean um, did all the blog posts and she wrote two original articles for the blog, which was awesome. And um, the blog was um, a new thing that I came up with because you know I don't have enough things on my to-do list apparently, but I thought it'd be great to have an opportunity for the students to share their writing we were able to share um, Brielle Tucker's speech from last year's graduation and Luis Alamon and um, Asita Tori uh, and Tiffany Colon both uh, submitted pieces that they wrote for their law school scholarly requirements. So we were able to tailor and edit it to post it on the blog post. So thank you so much, Abigail, for that. And Ray Petty Jr., who's awesome, awesome, awesome young man. He helped out with the podcast, which was brand spanking new, and we had to do everything from scratch, and he did a great job editing, doing introductions, um, and we basically had to learn together. You know, I was like, we're going to learn together, and it ended up being awesome. We have over 200 listens, and it's still being promoted, and so I expect over the summer more people will listen, particularly once we reopen our scholarship application. So I just want to give a shout out to our interns. Thank you so much for all your help. And it was a pleasure working with you. And of course, I look forward to continue to work with you all as you advance in your careers and celebrate um, your graduations as they come up. And so here's the part we've really been um, waiting for. Um, we want to hear from our scholars. And so um, they're gonna talk a little bit about what they learned in the program about themselves, share a little bit about the program as well and what they liked about it. 
Um, we had several modules, they received mentors, um, they had lots of articles that they had to read and review, and they did monthly reflections on the things that they learned. So. This slide, um, before I get into the program and my experience, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize and sort of um, express my gratitude to Jocelyn for starting this program. I had the unique experience of sort of witness the pilot program as an intern because I met her at a coffee at the courthouse, which is why I have this coffee little picture. Um, and ever since I met her, she's been instrumental to my experience in law school and helping me thereafter as I graduate in about two, three weeks. So just thank you so much for this. It's a need that the community, especially in Tampa Bay, the community needed. And I feel like it's definitely helping a lot of us um, in, in the diverse community and who are in law school and haven't had as much resources as they could have had. So that, that was amazing. And so I, before I get into the modules and sort of the specifics of what I appreciated about the program and what I took away from it, I made a little slide, um, my journey to Esquire, um, just to give a little glimpse of how I got here, I guess. So uh, I'm a first generation student and I put a little timeline in the bottom to sort of reflect stage to stage. Um, and I'm, I came from a community where, you know, as a first generation student, none of my parents went to college or, you know, especially grad school. So I've always had to like network and talk to people and learn for myself. So this program has definitely been sort of a supplement to my journey. And I am, I was so excited to be a part of it and continue to be a part of it thereafter. And then I built my presentation sort of to highlight some of my favorite modules during this program. Um, there's no particular order, but that's the way I've built it. So for this slide, I coupled the lawyer wellness module and the time management module together because I feel like that's a key thing to have as an attorney, especially uh, a beginning attorney. You have to keep mental health in mind because if you don't have that, everything could go downhill, in my opinion. So there has to be a balance that I feel like we must have coming into the practice of law. Of course, organization is going to be key because you need to know what you would have to do, you know, week to week, day to day, sort of. My organization is a planner, so I think it's important for you to learn how you organize. And um, during our time management modules and our, our, our talks with Jocelyn, she sort of emphasized that too, that you need to know yourself and see what would work for you, either virtually or physical. So like I said, a planner, a physical planner um, helps me. Um, getting enough sleep and staying active, uh, eating healthy, those factors would contribute to the mental health element when you come into the practice of law. And I would say before the program, especially my first year, those are things I put in the back burner because I was just so concerned that I, I had to do well, you know, I can't fall behind. And it was just always that, I guess, that little trigger in the back of my mind. But when I got involved with this program, especially my second year of law school, I started to realize, wow, if I sleep two more hours, I remember more of the things I read. If I work out, I get, I'm less stressed. So I'm really glad I started to implement these things. And then the last thing I put in this um, slide was outlets. And that just means either if you have a hobby, if there's a creative way for you to sort of let out stress, if you like to watch movies, all of those things are important because you can't study or read or work 24 seven. You have to have some sort of outlet that you could have fun, you know, let loose a little bit and then come back with even more enthusiasm to your work. So I think those are key things. Um, another module that I really, really enjoyed was the legal writing modules. I, I think it's important, especially myself, 
I don't have any lawyers in the family, so I didn't, I didn't have that pre-exposure of, you know, this is how you should write in research. This is the audience that you're tailoring your work to. So I always tried in my classes to, you know, pay as much attention and take as much as I could away. These legal writing modules were definitely a huge supplement to my schoolwork. Um, for example, I, the second one, we had a couple of attorneys come in, one private practice and one from public, um, public, the public sector. And they both gave differing perspectives that I had never considered. You know, putting pen to paper before like law school, I had to have everything perfect before I even started to type. And I realized the more I got, the farther I got along in law school, just putting a word on paper is going to get you started. It's about putting that first word down and then working from there. Um, in the modules, the attorneys talk about editing and the editing phase, which is extremely important because that's really where your writing is going to develop. So you could put whatever you need to write down, but the editing phase is where the magic is going to happen because that's where you get to catch mistakes, where you get to add things. So having time reserved for that is very important. I had never looked at it that way, so I'm glad that I was able to learn that. And of course, practice makes perfect. That's also something that they talked about even as seasoned attorneys, they still are not that perfect. It still kind of sucks to write the first draft because at the end you feel like, wow, what is this? Which is what gets you to the editing phase and then you know, having a finished work product. So the legal writing modules were extremely, extremely helpful to me because they offered a different, a new perspective I hadn't considered when tackling legal writing and creating work product. The judicial clerkships module I loved. <laughs> so uh, since I came into law school, I, I knew that I, I want to do a clerkship at some point. And um, at first, you know, before the program as a first year, I'm like, oh, how do you get a clerkship? You, there's only like select few. I didn't know a lot. So through the program and through Jocelyn, who was a former law clerk at the federal court, I, I've learned a lot and I've learned three things that everyone has their own path. You shouldn't close doors. And, you know, obviously it's an unparalleled learning experience. I've heard from attorneys who have practiced and gone to do a judicial clerkship and vice versa. Attorneys that get out of law school, go to clerkships and then go to private practice. So that helped me sort of framed my plans and know that I have to be flexible. Um, you know, it might not be right after law school, but that's still an opportunity that is there for me after I'm in practice, which I think I'll always consider. Um, don't close doors. Obviously, that's just whoever you meet or people that you could talk to who have done these clerkships, although maybe you're not applying for one right now. It's good to know those people and just hear from their experience, I feel, is more, most important because if... For example, when I'm applying, I can know what they did and take that into consideration. And just to reinstate, I think a clerkship is an amazing experience. I was able to intern for a district judge last semester and sort of shadow the law clerks and see his work behind chambers. So I feel like that experience was amazing, but as a clerk, as a law clerk, um, it would be ex expanded. So I like that much a lot. <laughs> And then, of course, bar prep. What I took away from the bar prep um, modules was it's another exam. It's just another exam. Um, and it's all about mindset. And that really, I'm really glad that we had one of our alums come in to talk during this module, Jemima, um, who passed, yay. <laughs> and she sort of reinstated what I've always, you know, kind of kept in mind that it's a mindset. It, if you tell yourself yourself you can do this, then you will do this. So just keeping a positive mindset throughout, knowing that you're capable. You know, thousands of attorneys, now attorneys have passed the bar, why can't you? So I think that was helpful. And specifically, the talk about routines and reaching out for help were things that I also um, appreciated because I know that routines should be structured, but talking talking through them in the modules was helpful because I was able to consider other ways I could um, set up routines and then of course reaching out for help when needed. So number one
this button, it'll be and then mentoring and paying it for those together because I feel that these offers. Um, so I think that's a huge factor for all of us in our law school careers, our law school journey and our law careers are after. And then paying it forward because once we're in our law careers, I think it should be an obligation that we mentor law students or students who want to get into the practice of law. Especially, that's especially one of my goals um, personally when I'm in the practice of law to mentor other students just because I know how how it feels like going through it. So I, if I know that I can help someone who may be in a similar position in the future, I of course want to. So that was really nice just hearing um, from different people who are now mentors, uh, who at one point were mentees. It's just sort of, you know, giving back to your community. And that's all I have for you. So thank you again to Jocelyn, Samaya, all the board members have been extremely helpful and our sponsors, you know, eternally grateful for you all. And I'm excited to continue being a part of this program as an attorney. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adriana LaForest and I'm one of the scholars for the Journey to Esquire program. Um, this is just going to be like a quick overview of my journey so far in the program. I'm going to start by highlighting this quote, if I could click on it. Um, you guys probably have recognized this. It's on the Journey to Esquire website, and also it's a quote that Jocelyn lives by and often quotes as well. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I'm going to be 100% honest. At the beginning of my law school career, I would not say that I was a believer in that quote. In my mind, I came to law school just to, you know, get the degree and come to make friends. I just came to get to my goal, get the degree, and pass the bar exam. But I realized over time that that's not how you get anywhere. I thought that if I want to go fast, I'm going to make it there far because I go fast and I run fast, like circular reasoning. It doesn't make sense. But um, I learned throughout the program that that is the true goal. Like you need to go together to get to your final destination. All right. So that first picture on the left is from my first day as a scholar. And the last picture is my graduation ceremony is still pending because of Corona. And um, I just wanted to first give thanks to all of the founders and the board members of this program. Um, I feel like you don't really realize the value of a program like this until you're a part of it, until you're attending events, seeing their impact on your community. I personally didn't know I needed to join an organization like this until I started. Going through law school, like many of the other scholars, I'm the first in my family to go to college, the first to go to law school. I come from a Haitian family. There's no like bar exam, there's no LSAT. So I had to learn a lot of it as I went along just like a lot of my other scholars that I've said. So I feel like joining this program, it kind of gave me the baseline and the foundation to see what I needed to do to get to my final goal. Um, one of my biggest takeaways I got from this program is the sense of community. Um, as you see here, there's a lot of different events that go on in the Tampa Bay community. The law community itself is pretty huge. We have the Hillsborough County Bar Association, we have GBA, we have APAC, we have a lot of different um, voluntary bar associations. And I usually go to those events alone, but I'm confident in every event that I go to that I see someone from Journey to Esquire, or someone that's spoken at one of our modules that's there and that recognizes me. So I'm never truly alone at these events. Um, I feel like it gives you that sense of community knowing that there's connections that you've made from this program that will go farther than just, you know, a Saturday meeting. Like you can see them in the store, you can see them at an import meeting and everyone remembers you and knows of this organization. Its name precedes itself. Um, one of my favorite modules um, is the Pay It Forward module. Um, this was by Regina Georgia. She was telling us a lot about, um, you know, paying it forward, giving back to your community, how doing like small acts of kindness can go a long way. And the point that really stuck out with me, but what really stuck out to me during that module was just kind of like the motivation behind giving back and paying it forward for people. For example, you could see on social media, people will be taking pictures of giving money to the homeless or giving them food and things like that. But they're not really doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it, you know, to get recognition, to get likes, to get people to say, oh, you know, so-and-so is a nice person. But to me, giving it back is more, much more than that. It's like, you know, kind of placing the roots for the future generation. 
that's why another one of my favorite parts was the Reach a Dream um, program. When we went to the elementary schools and we read to the kids, um, that's one of my favorite pictures. Um, at first, I was a little nervous because me and kids, you know, we don't really go hand in hand. But um, after a few times going, I realized that I really started to get attached to the children there. I looked forward to going there and talking to them, just asking them how their day was more than just reading. I feel like it's really a moment to kind of invest in the future. Like, especially that all of the lawyers that are going there were like diverse minorities. They could see people like them in successful positions and know that it's possible for them as well. Another um, important takeaway I got from this program was mentorship. With the program, when we applied, we knew that we would be given one mentor. Like, that was a given. But I didn't expect to gain even more than that. I found a mentor not only on Yashika Campbell, but in Jocelyn Hardrick, right here in that middle picture. Um, I felt like she was kind of like basically our group mom. Like, anything we needed, she was there for us. Her dedication to this program goes far beyond just the Saturday meetings. There'd be times I'd see her staying after talking to students before setting up at school, advocating for Journey to Esquire events. It wasn't just like a 10 to 12 event on Saturdays. She was there throughout the whole thing. There's even times when I would be sitting there like my, the wheels in my brain would start turning about something that was said at the module and we'd make eye contact and she'd be like, oh, we'll talk after. So I feel like she really took a lot of time to invest into each and every student in this program. Additionally, um, I found two other mentors and my fellow scholars, Marcia and Kishni. Um, Kishni's on the left in the red and Marcia's on the right in the blue. I'm um, not going to lie to you, at the first um, interview when we had our group interviews together, when I walked in the room, I was super confident and then I looked to the left and I saw Kishni and my heart instantly dropped into my stomach because I'm just like, that's Kishni. She works for the Academic Resource Center. She gets great grades. All the professors love her. Like, she's on Law Journal. I was like, I might not have this as much as I thought I did. And I looked to the right and I saw Marcia and then I just felt sick. I didn't think that I would, you know, make it because I had such um, a steep competition. Those ladies are people that I've looked up to, even though I haven't said that to them in words. Um, after being accepted, luckily all three of us were accepted. We bought, formed a bond, kind of like a sisterhood. We have a group chat. Like after the um, meetings, we would sit there and talk. Like I can go to them about advice about anything, whether it be bar prep. Um, they're one semester ahead of me whether it be just school, classes to take, just anything about life. And I feel like I gained a mentorship from everyone, not just the mentor assigned to me, but the scholars, the interns, the board members. And I'm just really thankful to have that opportunity. Um, next, um, where to you from here? Hopefully I can take the skills I've learned and um, worked on through this program to prepare myself for the bar exam and in the future give back to this program that's given me and other scholars so much. I love to pass and come back and either help the board with events, be a sponsor if I get a great job, and just be there for Journey to Esquire so that we can continue to feed this pipeline and continue to make a difference for people in our community. And before I end, I just wanna thank you to the founders, the sponsors, the Journey to Esquire board, all the attendees to the events, the interns who I know <laughs> Um, worked very hard for every event, every meeting, and everyone else who supported. Thank you. Hello, oh, my name is Forrest Sutton. I'm a Stetson student and also a scholar for the Journey to Esquire program. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, Journey to Esquire has been a, a, an invaluable uh, program for me. I mean, obviously, it was designed to provide opportunities for minority students to kind of hone their skills before they got into the profession. But for me, it's been much more than that. I mean, it's been something that has uh, kind of molded my personal development, my, my personal skills and helped me to grow um, for, for the future. You know, coming in to my third year and coming into the program specifically, reflections was something I never really did, right? Like for me, I thought if I did something and I did it, you know, pretty well, I must have known how it worked, you know, how to do it again, how to replicate that success, uh, but that, that wasn't the case. Um, and so having to sit down and kind of go through these modules and subsequently finish the reflections, I, I realized how little I knew before and, and how much kind of going through these, uh, again, made me a, a stronger and a more well-rounded person. Specifically, you know, you talk about leadership. I think for me coming in, I had a very, one-dimensional uh, outlook on leadership, kind of 
you know, I, I used to think, oh, well, for me, it's just, you know, just get things done, right? But I, I think there's a lot more that goes to it, you know, going through these modules, learning from other leaders. I, I've come to find out that it's a lot more about setting things up for success for the future, you know, and having the wherewithal to care about what comes next, what comes after for, for those who follow, and also making leaders out of the people that you work with. And that's something, you know, I, I, I wasn't uh, very informed on coming into the program, coming into my third year was something that I've developed uh, going into my second semester. And I've been fortunate, you know, since joining the program to win, you know, awards at Stetson for leadership. And that, that's something I don't know uh, would have happened otherwise. Uh, in addition, you know, mental health, I think mental health is something that a lot of people, let alone law students, kind of take for granted. And I, I'm kind of in that boat, too. I, I never really thought about it. Um, but this is, program has kind of redefined that for me. You know, coming in to law school and again, coming to my third year, uh, I, I suffered from, you know, stress related autoimmune disease. And it was something, you know, I, I kind of just figured out as I went along, you know, I, it, usually what would happen is I would, you know, start stressing, I would lose my hair in certain places and uh, something that first off a lot of people didn't know, but uh, that's something I struggled with. And so, you know, coming into the program, I thought I had a handle on it, um, but I, I realized that, you know, something that this program provides that I, I didn't know before is um, uh, figuring yourself out, right? And, and that's one of the biggest takeaways. I mean, obviously, you know, bar prep, obviously the legal writing seminars, all those have been something that I've taken to heart. They've been invaluable in my development as a future advocate. But the self-awareness that I've been able to come away with is something that I, I can't forget, um, even when I'm not practicing uh, law. Being able to know myself and that personal growth that this uh, program has provided me is something that's going to stick with me forever. Um, in addition, I mean, just the planning ahead, the forward thinkingness uh, that Journey to Esquire has provided. Uh, I, I think in law school, I had a tendency to kind of be in the moment. Um, and that's something that you can't do. I mean, you always have to be thinking, you know, what, what comes next um, and kind of how can I set myself up for, for future success? And so, you know, going through these modules, thinking about, you know, the next steps and having that forward thinking uh, mindset is something that is going to set me up for, for future development as well. And in addition to, to personal development, I mean, I, I, I couldn't undersell the professional side at all. I mean, you know, you talk about the networking, um, the mentoring, all those modules are something that I've taken to heart. And it's not just mentoring people that are uh, getting mentorship from people that are currently practicing, but even from my fellow scholars, you know, uh, when we have these group discussions, I learn things that, you know, I, I wouldn't have learned otherwise. I, I take away qualities and I take away advice that, you know, people either that are older or have more experience than me in certain areas um, help me develop it as a, as a person. And in addition, I mean, branding and marketing, I mean, that that's something I've always kind of taken to heart, you know, coming into law school, but um, this program has helped me to grow. And in that growth, I've learned just how important it is my brand and, and how to market myself. You know, you talk about LinkedIn or, um, you know, just that face-to-face -face kind of connection. I, I, it's been invaluable for me during the Esquire has been. Um, so kind of, you know, in conclusion, uh, I, I really want to thank obviously Jocelyn, but everyone that's been involved and, and not just the Journey to Esquire board um, and the interns, but my fellow scholars, um, because I think you guys have, had a positive um, outlook and a positive um, reaction on me to help me develop as an advocate, help me develop as a, a person. And so I, I think everyone involved has kind of catered to, to that growth as um, a, a future lawyer. And, you know, I, I look forward to paying it forward. And, and that's a module that we went through that really affected me because um, I know I, I may not be in a situation I'm in without Journey to Esquire and without those that were involved. And so I want to be that, that spark for others who come, who come after. And I, I think that the skills I've learned aren't just skills to get past the bar, aren't just skills to, um, you know, be a inter, entering lawyer, but lifelong skills that I take to heart to, to grow every day and help others grow too. So thank you.
everyone, my name is Kishni and I am a Journey to Esquire uh, class of 2020 scholar. So a little bit about me, um, I'm from South Florida. Um, I am Haitian American. This is my family in the middle. Um, I went to UCF for undergrad and WMU Cooley Law School. So um, I actually met Jocelyn uh, as a 2L at Cooley. There was an event and um, she shared this story before, but the way I met her was a little bit non-conventional. I um, was volunteering at the event and her mom um, was staring at me from afar and her mom came up to me and told, you know, she asked me where I was from and she thought that I looked a lot like Machina, um, which is Jocelyn's cousin. And she thought, you know, I, we must have been related. Maybe we are um, because we're both from Haiti. So um, Jocelyn came up and she apologized to me about her mom, you know, staring at me the entire event. And um, we made a connection there. And like Adriana said earlier, you know, I was trying to find the perfect word to describe Jocelyn, but she really is that group mom. Um, she has been so influential in my life and um, she's somebody that I look up to and I'll always look up to. Um, I started out as a 2018, 2019 intern and I don't know if Jocelyn knows this, but she helped me overcome one of my fears and that is public speaking. Um, I'm the epitome of an introvert. I feel like I write better than I speak. And I remember one time um, Jocelyn and I were just having a conversation and she asked me, you know, what was one thing that I felt like I needed to work on? And I said, public speaking. And she said, okay, great. I have an event. Um, next week or you know like next month and you're going to speak in front of all of the um presidents of the volunteer bar associations in tampa and a judge and throwing me in the water uh, like that helped me to overcome you know the fear and i have a picture down here uh, i applied some of the things that she taught me through that process. And um, my this is one of my um, friends, Lakira. We uh, competed in a moot court competition and won. So I appreciated everything um, about being an intern in the program. So then um, I moved on, you know, um, to becoming a scholar. And, you know, Jocelyn called me up and told me, you know, you're going to have to go through the same process. So I had to apply, do the essay, go through the interviews, the whole nine. Um, I didn't get, you know, special priority just because I was the intern. And, you know, I became a scholar and it has, again, it's just been another layer of just greatness and encouragement. Um, I was paired with Jamila Little. She was my... Um, mentor for the program and she was absolutely or still is absolutely phenomenal she's met with me multiple times you know has given me so many tips so i also appreciate her um in the program so one of the um modules that i um appreciated was the lawyer wellness module. And from each module, what I did was I always took something away and tried to apply it. So I remember Sarah, um, one of the attorneys presented at the module and she quoted something and she said, if you don't, don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. And it's something that I repeat constantly to myself. If I feel like something is bothering me or you know, there's a better way to take care of myself. I always repeat that quote and it just stuck with me. So um, aside from everything that we discussed, I felt like that was one of the things that really stuck out. <clears throat> the next module um, that I took something from was the diversity and inclusion module with Samaya and Sarah. Um, and one of the things, you know, in the profession, 
we always hear, you know, that the legal profession has to be diverse and we hear the word diversity and inclusion, but what I was introduced to was equity. You know, I've heard the word, but I guess it was the first time that I've ever had a discussion about the word equity. And Samaya asked the question and, um, you know, the whole um, group, you know, we kind of discussed it, but again, the word equity stuck with me and basically, um, you know, Samaya described it as being basically a tool that you need, not only do you need to be diverse, but you need equity in order to meet those standards or to be equal on an um, equal playing field as everyone else. So as an attorney, I know um, when I become a licensed attorney, um, I'll have to ask for certain things, for certain tools and, you know, training to become you know, that partner at the, you know, firm or to move up to the next level. So that was one of the things that um, I took away from the module. And the next seminar that I really appreciated was um, the legal writing seminar. And one of the things that stuck out to me in the seminar was um, Kristen Norris, or it might have been Jocelyn, who said, better legal writing starts with better time management. And I never looked at it that way. But um, sometimes, you know, right now I'm a law clerk at a civil litigation firm. And sometimes I'll get, you know, a lot of different tasks thrown at me. And, um, you know, with no deadline. So now I've made it a habit whenever I get something, I am the one to ask for a deadline and then I can manage my time effectively and know what to give priority to and work around that. So asking for deadlines is something that's important and um, it's really been effective and it's worked for me. So um, I also took that away from it. So the last slide that I have, um, it's a picture of me and my grandmother. Um, and now that the program is over, I, you know, I was just trying to think of how I could conclude. And I decided to share this picture just to, you know, kind of be transparent. Um, like I said before, I grew up as a Haitian American, a first generation um, Haitian American. Um, my parents were born in Haiti and they had um, me and my brother in their teens. So, you know, currently my mom is still in her 40s and my dad is 51. And having um, really young parents, um, my grandmother stepped in, it's my paternal grandmother, and she helped them raise us. So, you know, being in this time where everything is so uncertain, I just wanted to share like a brief story um, that my grandmother shared with me. Um, she recently passed away in August and um, I was helping my family with the funeral arrangements. And I remember when my dad sent me her death certificate, I saw that she had a third grade education. And at that time it dawned on me, um, something that she told me not too long ago. Um, she grew up really, really poor in Haiti in the mountains. And um, she had a cousin who was, you know, a little bit more privileged than she was. And she had um, a boutique in Port-au-Prince. So she gave my grandma a job as one of the servants in the boutique. And, you know, my grandma couldn't read or write. She couldn't do anything. But um, one of the tasks that she had was she had to clean up all the cornmeal that was on the floor. The um, cornmeal is like a staple food in Haiti. And um, every night there would be a lot of cornmeal spread out on the floor. So my grandma would, um, every night, she said she would take the cornmeal and she would like bag it. And instead of throwing it, it away, she washed it really good. And um, she made a drink, uh, this staple drink um, in Haiti, we call it akasa. It's made with cornmeal. And from there, she, she made her own drink from the scraps and she started selling it. So from there, you know, over time, she raised enough money to open up her own boutique. And eventually, you know, she got a visa, traveled to different countries and, you know, became a homeowner. And eventually she traveled to the States and um, ended up, you know, eventually becoming a U.S. citizen. 
So I share that because, you know, in this time, I feel like I'm left with the little cornmeal scraps and I don't really know what to do. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and job offers and the bar exam, everything is so uncertain. But um, just remembering that story and saying, you know, there's still hope. And even if you're left with scraps, you can still move forward and persevere and just don't stop dreaming and, um, you know, just push forward. So I'd like to thank everybody, Journey to Esquire, Jocelyn, all of the mentors, the panelists. This has really been a phenomenal experience and I hope to continue, you know, this is not the end of, you know, um, my interaction with Journey to Esquire. So just thank you everyone and that's it. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Bell. I am uh, a 3L at Stetson College of Law, and I am a Journey to Esquire scholar. And so I'll just start off, man, um, saying that, first of all, I had the privilege of um, actually sitting in on a couple of the modules because my then girlfriend and now fiance, uh, Grail Tucker, was also um, one of, she was also a, a scholar in, in the pilot program. So um, actually having the opportunity to sit in, to, to meet uh, the amazing board, um, to, to, to actually uh, experience that um, from the outside looking in, uh, it gave me uh, motivation, you know, to, to step out and, you know, actually try to, try to seize, that op seize that opportunity. So um, I guess I'll start off by saying that out of out of all of the amazing modules that 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 that, that I've experienced, the one that had the most that was the biggest impact on me uh, was the mindset module. And as you see here uh, with this screen here, um, and I guess in honor of of of, of the pandemic that we're, we're going through now, and um, you know, and, and everything that 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 comes with it, I think we have to start off by having the right mindset. Even even in a time like this, you know, where um, the unexpected has has, has, has taken hold of, of everything, we have to continue to um, to be forward thinking and have the right mindset. So that was that was that was one of the that was the most um, impactful impactful module for me, or one of the most impact, impactful modules, uh, the, the mindset modules, and in particular. Um, the wellness, <clears throat> the lawyer wellness module that we started the year off with, um, which talked about the importance of, of mental health, uh, the important importance of balance, um, remembering that you know you not only want to, <clears throat> you not only want to keep yourself um, in the right mindset physically or mentally, but you also want to take care of your body physically, and you want to you know take care of yourself spiritually. You know you need that balance so that. Um, you 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 can be in a position to to not only keep yourself pushing but to reach out and help help others. Um, and another module uh, that I say f fall under that mindset uh, category is the the bar prep um, module where we discuss the metacognition um, techniques. Um, that impacted me in a, in a in a great way because you know growing up. Um, you know, uh, in high school and undergrad, you know, I was kind of the one who would just study enough, you know, to uh, learn the material temporarily, you know, and then I'll take those exams and, 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 and do, do pretty well. On them. And then, you know, I'll just throw it out of my memory and, and keep pushing. But uh, this bar prep uh, metacognition uh, module actually, um, it, it, it taught, taught me the importance of, you know, actually learning the material long term, you know, and that's something that, you know, um, I, 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 I don't think I would have placed um, as, as much emphasis um, on it because, you know, um, it was something that I had, I had an experience prior, prior to, 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 to Journal to Esquire. So, that transitions into my into my next slide. 
which talks about uh, the 2% mindset. And for me, um, I grew up um, in the Mississippi Delta. You know, I don't have any family um, out here, you know, so I made the decision to, uh, you know, step out of my comfort zone and, 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 start, and, and start fresh um, in, a, in, a, in a place where, where I've never, you know, I've never been and had no family or whatnot. Because I figured that, you know, that that that's one of the best ways to to develop. Um, not only for me as a, as a young man, but you know, I think for all of us, you know, it's comfortable. As you can see, as this slide provides, it's comfortable to you know kind of settle in your comfort zone. But you know, not a lot of the population actually step outside of those bounds. And uh, Journey to Esquire gave me the confidence, you know, to step out of those bounds. You know, to to uh, through the mentor mentorship modules, um, through the, the the wellness modules, you know, it, it gave gave me the confidence, you know, to reach out, you know, to take hold of those leadership um, roles and those uh, amazing opportunities. So, speaking of stepping out of the comfort zone, um, I'm going to do something that I've really never done before. It won't be any singing or anything, but um, I kind of I wrote a poem that kind of summed up my uh, my journey to Esquire experience. So <clears throat> so it's entitled uh, The Journey. And it's been said that the only impossible journey is the journey you never begin. But I started my law school journey with some doubt. At times I doubted if I finished, yet alone win. I started the journey confused, questioning my identity. I mean, how could I not have all these questions when the majority did not look or sound like me? But when my, but then my law school journey merged into the journey to Esquire, which helped me regain my identity. The diversity module restored my confidence, made me proud to be called a minority. I learned the difference between equality and equity. I learned that bias is not always known. I learned the importance of addressing systematic bias and how diversity and inclusion can make work feel at home. But as a first generation law student, I needed more than just my confidence restored. I needed to learn how to maneuver, how to shake the right hands to get, to get my feet in the door. And for that journey to Esquire gave me access by showing the importance of networking and mentorship. This journey showed me that it's not only about being a hard worker, but you also must know the right people and be well equipped. Growing up in the Mississippi Delta, the most famous pipeline was from the, from the school to the prison. Instead of graduating, most class, classmates dropped out or were locked up, and most role models were either rapping or dribbling. But while on this journey to Esquire, I was introduced to a new vision, one that revealed I have to do more than just make it out but I have to turn around, give back, and help others when I'm winning. I used to think I needed money, power, and fame to truly live. But this journey has taught me that we build a life with what we, but we build a life with what we gain, but we change a life with what we give. You see, this journey I've learned, on this journey I've learned, that paying it forward is a debt that I owe because it allows me to lay another pipeline for those coming after me, one that will plant, nurture, and help those younger seeds grow. This journey has truly prepared me for the time when I will have to make those big decisions. I've learned that you have to expect the unexpected, even when you enter the year with 2020 vision. So thank you, Journey to Esquire, for equipping me with the tools to keep a steady pace. I'm forever indebted to you for showing me how determination, authenticity, and purpose will help me finish the race. And that's pretty, pretty much all of uh, all of my presentation. You know, I just uh, thank thank DAP for, well, thank Journey to Esquire for you know um, just you know giving me the chance and <clears throat> just uh, giving giving all of us. Uh, I think I can speak for all of, all of the scholars on this, giving giving us all, giving us all something that that we'll cherish for the uh, for the rest.
rest of our lives. You know, so thank you to to the board, you know, to the uh, to the to the founders, to the the, the fellow the fellow scholars, uh, just to ev everyone involved for for all you you've given. And um, I'll for like I said, I'm a poem I'm forever indebted to you, and I can't wait uh, to get back to Broken. That's all. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm ha happy to be here. Um, it's an honor. It really is. Um, I couldn't tell you um, where I was and where I am now. And I am so grateful to Journey to Esquire and this scholar program. And I have a quote. It says, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that it will lead others to join you. And that's from our great Ruth Ginsburg. And I realized that in this program, it has offered me so much. Um, like Jocelyn says, I'm a second career student. Um, I came here um, a year ago and I walked into this room with these young, beautiful people. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm 20 years older than them. Um, my son is probably their same age. Uh, so, and I felt so embraced by everyone, by the board, by my mentor, by Jocelyn, by the modules. I learned so much, honestly. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, thank you, um, Samaya. Thank you to Jamila, Brielle, Suzanne, the board members. You guys did an awesome job with this program. Um, as a sec second career student, I felt um, going through law school for me was a challenge because I thought that I didn't have certain things um, to propel to the next level as a law student. Um, I felt like there was things that I was inadequate in, I didn't have enough time, and going through this program and meeting different people they really um, put a confidence in me to know that, listen, okay, you're a second Korea student, but you've had 20 years of experience working. And they let me realize some of the things that I possess was my attributes to pull me forward to that next level. And um, I'm so grateful for that because I always thought that I had to do more spend more time studying. There's no doubt. I really do. I am older, so I do have to spend more time studying, more time rereading the books, but I felt a confident throughout this program that what I possessed in my past, I can use that and what I'm learning through law school and um, learning in this program to propel me to the next level. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, Read to Dream I know Adriana talked about the little kids, but since I have two boys, well, they're older, but two kids, I felt you know so warm with them and they were running around. I remember Adriana and I had a session together and she's like, oh my God, Marcy, I don't know what I'm gonna do with these kids. I said, just <laughs> calm down, <laughs> tell them what they wanna hear, read to them, hug them. And they loved her so much. So I think, that whole purpose of the journey to Esquire, the inclusion, the diversity, the pay it forward, it, it really is an awesome theme because I feel like we have done so much and I don't want us to stop. I want us to continue to pay it forward, continue to uplift other students. Also our interns, they've been so awesome throughout this program. Um, also, another module that we had was the, um, the diversity, like I talked about. That was an awesome program. And also the clerkship, um, judicial clerkship. And that was one thing that I was uh, apprehensive about because I always was interested in that program. And when they came and discussed that and we had videos and we had to do the reflection papers, I really never thought that there was opportunity for me to do a clerkship. So Jocelyn and this program opened up so much opportunities um, for us and for myself. And 
I really want to emphasize how much what we can do when we pull together, how much we can do when we have a mindset of confidence, of a mindset of giving back, of a mindset of determination that we can pull through these things. So um, there was one thing I um, wanted to uh, say to Jocelyn, like she's always, um, I, we used to have our like weekly calls and sometimes I would be in the gym and um, she would tell me, okay, you have to prepare for this. And then I said, well, my son needs his breakfast and he needs his lunch. And she's like, listen, you better tell him how to cook in that kitchen, make some eggs, make some macaroni. But she has just been, I know a lot of people say like a mother, but she has really been like a really good sister to me, a close sister to me. And she's helped me um, throughout this program. And also my mentor, I want to say to Sarah, I mean, she has been awesome. She has done a couple of modules with us and um, she's reached out to me. She's also um, told me that no matter, <laughs> you know, your age or your second career student, you can do this. Um, so I am just really grateful. Um, I sit here and um, want to say this quote by Nelson Mandela. It says, do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and get up again. And I feel like just keep on pushing. I have to take the bar in July. And with this whole COVID pandemic, it's like it puts you in um in a mood of uncertainty, but I just know that we can do it, um, put my mind to it and we can um, push forward. Um, like, again, I wanna thank the board um, for everything they've done and also the interns and also all the scholars, Anna, you know, Adriana, Kishni, Justin and Forrest, you have been awesome. Um, and to look forward that we can not take the things that we've learned and to, to pull forward. One thing I do wanna to continue to do is do the uh, read to dream, also look into the compliance area that I've always um, wanted to do as an attorney and also the innocent project um, to give back. So thank you again, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for your time. So Anna Leonard, Stetson University, College of Law. Adriana LaForest, WMU, Cooley Law School. Forrest Sutton, Stetson University, College of Law. Kishni Theus, WMU, Cooley Law School. Justin Bell, Stetson University, College of Law. And Marcia Friff, WMU Cooley Law School. Congratulations to all of our graduates. I love these pictures. Um, Yasmin Ramaha from WMU Cooley Law School took our photo shoot and gave us these beautiful pictures to help us share on social media and everywhere else. And now um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Brielle Tucker, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker. And as I mentioned earlier, Brielle is. Um, an alum of the program, and now she's a current board member. So take it away, Brio. Yes, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, before I get started with our introduction of our keynote, I just wanna say how, um, how fulfilled I feel with everyone's presentations, you know, having been through this experience and then seeing you all now getting exactly what I got from the experience last year. It, it really fills my spirit with joy. So I just wanna say thank you all for going through this amazing program. And I hope you continue with it as in your future endeavors. Um, but this morning, um, it is a pleasure to be able to introduce a speaker who's not only my sorority sister, but someone who I've been in the audience and listened to her speak on um, two occasions. And now this will be the third occasion. And I'm very excited. Um, so I just hope that you all get from her what I have. So our keynote today is Bamitra Salter Liggins. She is a longtime banking executive and currently serves as the Chief Strategy and Operations Officer for United Way Suncoast. Prior to joining United Way, she served as Florida Managing Director at Mutual of Home 
of Omaha Bank, and she has worked in the financial service industry for um, well over 15 years. She is the daughter of an Air Force chaplain and has lived in 10 states and two countries. She attended Christian Brothers University in Memphis, Tennessee on a basketball scholarship and received her Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration and her MBA from Wake Forest University. She's very active in our community, serving as on the Board of Trustees for Christian Brothers University, Community Tampa Bay, and the City of Tampa's Police Review Board. She is also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, is a 2013 Leadership Tampa graduate, was named an up-and-comer by the Tampa Bay Business Journal in 2013, and a finalist for Businesswoman of the Year by the Tampa Bay Business Journal in 2017. Bimitra, along with her twin sister, Demetra, is the founder of Corporate Homey, a career, lifestyle, and advice company and podcast dedicated to assisting professionals in navigating the waters of corporate America. She lives in Tampa and enjoys cooking, listening to music, and of course, playing golf. So without further ado, I would love to introduce to you, Ms. Bimitra Salter-Liggins. Thank you, Brio. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, let me just say um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Jocelyn, thank you for having the vision to start a program like this. I have learned so much from each of you and been inspired by each of you this morning, sharing your journey. So hopefully I say something that uh, will be helpful because I'm all full now just from listening to y'all's background. You know, Anna talking about being a first generation, you know, uh, law student and Adriana talking about the sense of community she's gotten from the program. Forrest talking about him growing from being one dimensional to a sense of community. Uh, Justin, uh, my family's from the Mississippi Delta as well, so I hope you eat catfish and spaghetti with uh, light bread, not white bread, but light bread. So uh, that's a Friday thing for folks from the Mississippi Delta. Shout out to that. Uh, Kishni, I love listening to you talk about your grandmother and her ingenuity and entrepreneurship. And then last but not least, uh, Marsha started with an RBG quote, how can we not love that? and then finish with a Nelson Mandela quote. I mean, like that's just absolutely awesome uh, to sandwich those two things in. So uh, just let me say thank you. Um, I will say, you know, I heard you guys talk a lot about building your confidence and whatnot. One of my favorite philosophies in life is competence brings confidence. So the more you're prepared, the more comfortable you are doing things, uh, the more confident you are and what you bring to the table. A lot of that probably comes from my basketball background. One of the reasons why you want the ball in your hands at the end of the game is because you've been practicing. You've shot that shot a hundred times. You've put yourself in the mindset of winning the game. And you also understand that if you miss the shot, you're going to live to, to shoot another game, to play another game. So I would say, you know, don't be worried about uh, making mistakes and, and that type of thing. Uh, congratulations to each of you. Uh, you are living, breathing examples of what hard work and perseverance can do, especially when you don't always have an example of someone who looks like you to give you the confidence that you can get there. So programs like this are incredibly uh, important. In the event that you did not know this, you are now joining an elite group of diverse professionals, less than 10% of people of color in our country here in the United States have a terminal degree. So to, if you didn't know that, you're, you're now joining an elite group of professionals. So I just want to take a moment and give you guys all a big round of applause for everything you've accomplished so far. So <laughs> thank you, Brielle, for joining me and clapping. <laughs> so as we join together virtually uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, I mean, this is just a great reminder that people and parents and professionals that have the ability to change are gonna be the folks who win. They're gonna be our leaders. They're going to be the folks that are most valued. Uh, I'm sure when each of you were planning for everything you wanted to accomplish in 2020, it didn't include social distancing. It did not include being on nine Zoom meetings a day. 
It did not include safer at home or club quarantine and IG artist battles. And most importantly, cooking every meal. I don't know about you guys, but I've been cooking so much. My oven is confused. It's, it thinks it's Thanksgiving in our house. My oven is like, what is happening? What are you guys doing? I am looking forward to hearing the words. May I start you with a drink and an appetizer? <laughs> I cannot wait to get out and about. Uh, as real just noted, I just got married. So I'm really glad I married somebody that I like because we're spending a lot of time <laughs> together. So, but all jokes aside, uh, the ability to swerve, the ability to change, that's a skill that's going to better serve you than any torts or tax class or anything you took in law school, just that ability. Uh, our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, defines that in her book is the ability to pivot. And so I just want to let you take this as not as, man, what are we going to do? This is awful, but use it as an opportunity to say, you know what? I have the ability to be flexible. I have the ability to adapt. And it's not just you. Right now, every single industry, every single company is trying to figure out how to adapt, how to take their whatever their revenue model is and take it into a remote place how to keep their businesses afloat when you're not having a brick and mortar that's open, how to keep your employees engaged. Uh, I love that you guys talk a lot about mental health and uh, taking care of yourself personally. That is a piece that I missed early in my career. I was so busy grinding and working hard, I forgot to take care of myself. And if you don't take care of you, you can't be good to anyone else, not to your family, not to your job, not to your community. Um, we have no idea when normal will return or how normal will be defined. Uh, at this point, we just have to you know, enjoy the journey of pivoting right now. Um, we have to enjoy looking at new ways to do business, new ways to shop, most importantly, new ways to have meaningful connections with family members and friends. So. Uh, as Brielle mentioned, I, I'm a Delta. I just celebrated uh, my 25th year in Delta on the same day as my 45th birthday. So I have crossed on my 20th birthday. But uh, well, we, you hear me say we, me and my twin sister crossed on our, on our 20th birthday. And I had a chance to get on a Zoom meeting with friends from seven different states and whatnot. No one would have ever taken the time to do that in a pre-COVID environment. Is, I mean, let's be clear, we're talking about, you know, middle-aged black people, people would have thought that was corny. Like, I want to have a video call and get everybody like, yeah, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to make that. Right? Whereas commercially, it was like really nice to get everybody, everyone uh, together. If you look at this kind of, uh, you know, joy of journeying and learning to pivot, um, we also have to make sure that we're doing what's right for us and what's right for our careers and not letting noise uh, affect that. The state of Georgia is a great example. I'm sure you guys are keeping up what's going on there where the governor is like, hey, it's okay to get your hair done or go get a tattoo or go to the beauty or barbershop. And then the mayors of the major cities are saying, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't want folks congregating right now and our numbers go back up and we get sick. And so it's just a reminder that you have to make what's best for you, that good decisions for you and not look for someone to spoon feed that to you. Um, my advice to each of you is to have a framework for your career, where you wanna go. And I know a lot of times for a young and tenure in their career attorneys, they've got this set path that they wanna go on. And it looks like associate to partner, to managing partner, to like Supreme Court justice, right? Like everybody's got like how they have it laid out and where they wanna go. And I think having flexibility in your career and being open to non-orthodox uh, opportunities will serve you well. That's something that has served me well uh, in my career. I think of uh, careers a lot like uh, a GPS system, right? You put in an address where you'd like to go, and then sometimes something happens and you have to get off and go a different direction, but you're still going to go where you meant to go in the beginning. You may just take varying paths to get there. Uh, personally, I've done a lot of this and uh, have, I always know when I'm making the right kind of crazy decision when everyone doesn't understand it. 
is I figure if I'm doing what everybody understands, then I'm not pushing myself. I'm not outside of my comfort zone. So, you know, a little bit about my background. Uh, I started out actually in IT sales. So a lot of people know what that is now since everybody's working remotely, but that's those, you know, remote uh, access tokens that you, that you get into. I sold those in the late 90s and uh, was enjoying that and doing well uh, financially and whatnot. Uh, but I wasn't passionate about what I did. And then I remember uh, being at work and one of my coworkers was about the age that I am now. And he was telling me that, you know, something that had happened at at and like 20 years before. And I said, oh, what job were you doing then? And he was like, this one. And I thought, I don't want to do this for 20 years. Like, I want to do something else. I don't want to chase a, a sales quota when, I, when I'm in my 40s. And so I decided to um, go back to school and get an MBA in finance. And I went left Memphis and went to Wake Forest. And, um, and then when I graduated from there, I wanted to get into banking. And I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. So I took a lot of informational interviews and um, wound up choosing a bank that had a management program for uh, newly minted MBAs at, at a bank called uh, BB&T, which is now called Truist. And BB&T at the time was not this big sophisticated bank that it is today. It was this Eastern North Carolina tobacco farm bank. And my classmates made fun of me and told me I was going to work for Hillbilly Bank and Trust and this that, and the other. And I kind of laughed. Uh, but I, what I, the reason I chose bb and is at the time they had just bought a bank that put them in Florida. They had just bought a bank that put them in Atlanta. And I thought to myself, they're going to need diverse people to be in these diverse markets. And if I go there, I can probably move up the food chain quicker than I could go into Wells Fargo or B of A. So it, 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 so it looked like I was taking a step sideways, not necessarily back. But it ended up being one of the best decisions that I that I ever made. And, um, you know, I took a pay cut to do it. And, you know, everybody thought it was crazy. Like, who goes back to school to go work for this little small bank to make less money? Like, you're doing it all wrong. And I just remember thinking, like, me and Jesus, we got a plan. And it's okay if nobody else <laughs> understands, right? <laughs> right. And so, and we did. And so uh, very much the same thing when uh, I just, as Riel mentioned, I like to think of myself as a retired bank executive who now works as an executive and not for profit. And the same thing, people thought that I was I was crazy. You know, uh, you, you lead a state and now you're going to go and be the chief operating officer for United Way. But I've been doing this for three months and could not be more pleased with the skills that I'm growing, growing myself, uh, putting myself in a situation to be a CEO of a major nonprofit or business later. Again, I saw the see this as a stepping stone. And then now I'm a part of this solution. We're in the middle of a pandemic. United Way could not have a bigger role in our community. I mean, we have we have so much need out there with food insecurity, financial insecurity, and I'm a part of helping with that. That is not what I would be doing if I was in banking. What I'd be doing is telling people that they need to pledge their life savings to keep paying us their loan. And that's just not fun work to do. So I'm really, really excited uh, that, you know, God gave me the vision to change at the time that I did to be a part of this, to be a part of this solution. Um, I would also encourage you that you are going to take roles, you're going to get jobs, be put in situations where people don't believe in you. This is why it's important that you believe in yourself. When I got into banking, I was not what people thought a banker looks like. And I mean the people who worked for me. Hear me clearly. I'm not old. I'm not white. I'm not male. And so, and many times I had the people who worked for me, not with me, basically be surprised that I had something to teach them, be surprised that I had something that they could learn from. So, if you are thinking now, I'm listening to you guys all talk about your journey, that you're going to get to a place in your career where people don't question your competence, people don't question your knowledge, people don't question your skill set, you're wrong. I, I haven't gotten to that place. I'd love to tell you when I get to that place, my twin sister and I joke about this. It's one of the reasons we started Corporate Homing because we're like, people need to know that they're not alone. The things that you're experiencing, the challenges that you have, it doesn't matter if you are a lawyer or a banker or an architect, 
or CPA or superintendent, a uh, principal of the school, we're all experiencing the same, you know, thing, which is why we're like, if you have friends at work, homies at work, hence the name, corporate homie, these are the things that we can help each other with. So I just want to encourage you that you've got to make yourself and believe in yourself because sometimes you're going to be the only person that does that in your organization. And so you can't get slowed down or swayed by that. Uh, when I was at the bank, my, I got promoted to market president. I was so excited. I went to my first market president meeting. There's about 150 people in the room. I'm pumped. You know, it's a banker. So everybody's in a dark suit with a white shirt. You know, just nothing, you know, nothing, nothing unique about the way bankers dress at all. And I remember the president of the banking network came up and was like, oh, Dimitri, we're so excited about you taking over the cab. And I thought, oh, my goodness, he has an amazing memory. He knows my name. And then as I sat down and I looked around the room, I was the only black woman. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, he knows me because it's just me. Right? His memory's not that good. That was the first thing I thought. Then the second thing I thought is, how did I get this job? Like, they don't let people like me have this job. And I had to remind myself that I earned that job and not to be overly grateful for the job and to still push for new opportunities, to still push and not just be satisfied. So I just wanted to share that with you, that that will continue to happen uh, for you and to you in this career, in your career. The two most important things that will come out of your career that it will, for you guys, especially as, uh, as attorneys, as JDs, are relationships and counsel, okay? I cannot stress this enough. I don't know how many of you have heard about the uh, PPP loans that banks, have, that businesses have been trying to get. Um, there was a small pot of $349 billion, which I know that doesn't sound small, <laughs> but there was a small pot of 300. The challenge is the way they wrote the, the, the parameters, so many businesses qualified that the money was not going to be available for a tremendous amount of time. And so if you did not have a relationship with a banker, not a bank, an individual, a person who could shepherd you through that process, a person who could give you good advice about how to do it. So for us, because I had been in banking, I was getting seven or eight emails throughout the week. They changed this, they're changing this. Here's what we think the application is going to look like. So the day the application dropped and with my relationships and my background, I was able to get us to apply as soon as possible. And we got our money, I don't know, a week or so ago, right? Before it ran out. I bring that story up because America is still, as I like to say, going to America. So even though they're like, everybody is equal, it's not a meritocracy. So even in this PPP loan, which is an, just an analogy of how the world works, bankers were calling you know, regional presidents and then they were slotting money for certain companies before their applications even got in. And so you're here you are applying in, you know, ABC franchise owner, you don't have anybody to talk to and you think you're applying on this level playing field and you're not. And that's just the way the world is. And to the extent that people do not understand that everything is relationship driven, I, can't, I wanna hammer that home today. So it's about relationships, whether it's the next job you're going to get, the next opportunity, the promotion that you get is uh, uh, one of my favorite speakers uh, that I'm having kind of a business girl crush on is uh, one of our sororities is uh, Carla Harris. And she talks about every major decision in your career is made when you're not in the room. How much of a raise are you going to get? Are you going to get promoted? Which, which case are you going to be on? Which partner do you get to work with? Nobody comes and asks you, Demetra, how much of a raise would you like? Justin, do you want to be on this project? Adriana, do you want to work with this partner? That's not how it works, which means you have to have good relationships with people who will be in there advocating for you, pulling for you, explain, explaining things that you can do that maybe people who haven't had an opportunity to directly work with you have so that you can make good things happen. And people can't do that if you don't open up. So one of my sister's favorite phrases is you cannot be diverse and mysterious, right? So you have to be willing to open up a little bit. And I've heard, you know, uh, people over the years, especially uh, my cousins from Memphis, uh, for those of you who don't know much about Memphis, Memphis is about 89% African-American. So I have cousins that you know, did well academically in school, 
And then everyone in my family, except for my sister and I, went to Tennessee State University, which is an HBCU. And then, you know, they do well there. And then your reward is you go to corporate America. And now you're in this environment of people you've never been around. So they would be offended at work with people asking them what I think are benign questions like, what did you do this weekend? And then it's like, why are these people in my business? It's like, no one really cares. They're just being polite. It doesn't really matter what the answer is, right? What you can't do is come across as like that's intrusive. But if you don't know that, so you don't. So how are you going to get promoted at work when you won't even tell somebody you went to a fair for the weekend? You won't even tell somebody, oh, I hung out with friends. It doesn't need to be details, right? So relationships matter. Every business that secured a PPP loan was because of a relationship. Every business that did not was probably because of lack of a relationship. So that's just one example about how and why relationships matter. The other thing is specifically related to you guys, counsel and good advice. All everybody wants in a business relationship, in a professional relationship is good advice, right? It doesn't even matter if the advice is 100% accurate. It doesn't need to be 100% accurate. Like I used to tell my bankers that work for me, it doesn't matter if your take on what's going to happen in the economy is right. It matters that you have an informed opinion to share with your clients. And this is going to be the same thing for you guys as, as attorneys, as counselors, as advisors, is that people are looking for you to be prepared, know things, be read up on things that they're not to be able to help them and assist them. So everybody is looking for sound advice, sound counsel from the relationships that they've built. I want to leave you with this. Knowing how to weather a storm is important, but you also have to know how to dance in the rain. And that couldn't be more important than what we have going on right here. So Jocelyn, Brielle, thank you so much for letting me share this morning. Let's always talk about how I'm teaching them so much, but honestly, I always learn something from every single event. And so the whole, every major decision made in your career is made when you're not in the room. I, you know, that just was like, oh, that is true. And even when they ask you, they're pretending to ask you to be polite. <laughs> they're like, oh, who do you want to work with? Either they've already decided it, or they're just going to decide it, but they want to want you to feel like you're involved. But the reality is it's being made without you. So that's awesome to remember. And that's why relationships matter. And so that is my biggest thing for my students. Like you got to form these relationships. And when we, they know if I'm at an event, I'm like, come here, talk to this person, meet this person, talk to that person, get that person's card, send an email. Or if they've had trouble with their mentors, I'm like, follow up again. The person is just really busy. Um, even, you know, coaching Brielle to get in touch with you, I'm like, she's probably really busy with everything going on. But then, you know, when we circle back, it's going to happen, you know, and it's like, we'll have you. And if you're unavailable, cool. If you're available, cool. And I'm just so happy you were available. <laughs> um, and it's so funny, you know, I thought you were a lawyer because every time I met you through someone, it was a lawyer, Meredith Freeman, who was my mentor and lawyer, um, Judge Goodwin Costello, who was my classmate. Um, I've seen you at Jiva events. I mean, everything I've seen you at was lawyer related. And someone had to say, no, she works in banking. <laughs> She's not a lawyer. And I used to work in banking. I was with J.P. Morgan Chase for five years mm -hmm. through a um, scholarship internship program. And I watched people go through the management development programs as well. And so I modeled this um, journey to Esquire is kind of modeled on those, on those concepts, you know, going through <laughs> models, working in teams. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because banking and law, they have so many things in common. The mm -hmm. black suit, white shirt, right? You go to these places, everybody looks the same, not very diverse, but they're seats of power. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the way you explained the PPP loans, I saw in the news that they ran out of money and we're like, that was a billion with a B. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Right? Well, but the relationships mattered. Mm -hmm. And when and you set it up the way you do, and um, I mean, you know, you looked at some of the large companies that were getting dollars. Yeah. that basically the media shamed them into giving it back, you know, right. Shake Shack yeah. and Bruce Chris, you know, that type of yeah. thing. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they called it small business loan. They're thinking those don't sound like small businesses, but if you define it a certain way. Right. And that's what lawyers do. We get <laughs> to define these rules, right? Or we get to figure out how right. they're defined and interpreted so that we can help the people around us get access when they need it or advocate against something if it's not working because we have to be the ones to explain it. And mm -hmm. so thank you so much for your um, thoughts and the spirituality where, you know, a lot of us, we're Christian and Muslim and um, have other forms of spirituality. We talk about God a lot and how, you know, we look towards our spirituality to guide us in everything that we do.
So thank you for bringing that up as well. Um, and letting people know that that's okay. Cause sometimes we go into these environments and people are either atheists or, um, um, you know, they believe in God, but they're not really into spirituality. And sometimes they might look at you sideways. You know, if you talk about that being a part of your decision process in your life, and we have to know that we have to bring our whole selves, just like you said, you, you can't be diverse and mysterious. <laughs> Doesn't work. No, that's, that's another, that's a great takeaway. That quote is definitely going up on social media. Um, you know, but we do have to bring our whole selves in when we do, we find a way to do it comfortably. So thank you so much, Bermitra, and congratulations on getting oh, married. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the Diversity Access Pipeline, Inc. was created to promote diversity within the legal industry, create access for students of all backgrounds, and feed the pipeline with lawyers who lead, mentor, innovate. I think Kishni added that one, and inspire, which is awesome. And um, we believe in big ideas, inclusion, diversity, equity, access, and service. And as you heard from all the students' presentations, that's coming to fruition. That's what's happening through the year in the program. So for those who are watching, um, just want to let you know, if you want more information about the program, please visit our website, like our social media pages for more information about all the different programs we have. And you go to www.journeytoesquire.com. But this program would not be possible without our sponsors, partners, supporters, mentors, and panelists. Here are our mentors, panelists, and supporters. And here's the list of people who either appeared on our podcast, who supported us and, and helped share the information, who gave us services, who came to speak to our students, and who mentored our students. And you see there's a very long list of people. If I left anyone else off, I'm so sorry. Uh, hopefully we were able to give you a shout out through social media um, when you were particularly involved. But all of these people came to speak to our students, spend time with them, share information, invite our students to their events, um, talk about their private experiences, their personal challenges and triumphs, and to give ways to help students and people who are coming behind them, alongside them, um, information about how to avoid some of the common misconceptions, um, how to build confidence in yourself, and how to just kind of navigate your way through this journey to Esquire. And here are our sponsors who gave uh, monetary donations or in-kind donations. So we'd like to thank Bush Ross, Butler Y. Mueller, Katz Craig, um, Western Michigan University Cooley Law School, Little Law PA, Agape, Christian Bar Preparation Services, St. Pete Bar, um, association, Hillsboro Association for Women Lawyers, and the United States District Court, Middle District of Florida.